the renowned American scientist, inventor, and educator, the late Charles Franklin Kettering. Kettering greatly admired his fellow inventor, Thomas Alva Edison, and as founding president of the Edison Foundation, Kettering worked to encourage young people to be interested in careers in science and engineering and to have a better understanding of research and invention. Kettering was a Midwesterner. He was born in 1876 on a farm in Ohio. He began his own education in a one-room school and returned later to a similar school as its teacher. Kettering attended Ohio State University and secured a Ph.D. in electrical engineering there. Upon graduation, he joined the National Cash Register Company with the assignment to electrify the cash register. He did so. He then quit to invent the self-starter for the automobile. This was the beginning of a long career of success in the automobile industry. From 1919 until his retirement in 1946, Kettering headed research for General Motors. His inventiveness was responsible for many important developments, including high-octane gasoline, fast-drying paint, a safe refrigerant, the diesel locomotive, among others. In his later years, he devoted to continuing research interests in medicine, joining in the creation of the Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research. Kettering set up laboratories to study the mystery of photosynthesis and the problems of magnetic fields. He died in 1958 at the age of 82. Throughout his life, Kettering had a strong interest in education and served as a trustee and chairman of the board of both Antioch College and Ohio State University. Kettering was always interested in exploring new avenues for improving education. He was most anxious about the young explorers, as he called our youth. He was intensely in favor of preserving the child's power of imagination and invention. He greatly favored the kind of education that succeeded in encouraging children to experiment for themselves. He thought that the process of giving tests and grades to students frequently had an adverse effect on their willingness to experiment and try. Not knowing the right answer means failure for the child in school, but in adult life, Kettering often said, a scientist in a laboratory spends most of his life not knowing the right answer. This is not important so long as he finally succeeds in learning what the right answer is. For this reason, Kettering often called himself a professional amateur. In encouraging young people to look up, to find out, Kettering thought that the educational system in many ways was operated to get in the way of the children. Their ability to learn was often hindered by what adults did to them. He believed that it was very important to begin to teach children at a very early age how hard it is to do anything new. If this were understood when young, Kettering thought that adults would not become so discouraged and frustrated and give up their efforts to invent new things when they encountered failure and disappointment because they would expect it. Kettering participated in a number of conferences on education and spoke to large groups of educators. His talk on An Inventor Looks at Education, he delivered at an Edison Foundation Institute in 1955. It is my pleasure now to introduce Mr. Kettering as he speaks to a large audience of leaders of education. When Mr. Phelps asked me about a subject, I thought since we were here honoring uh, the memory of a the world's greatest inventor, it might be a good idea to take a little look at this educational thing from the standpoint of an inventor. You know, inventors are sort of a disappearing race. Most people speak of inventors as long hair or screwballs, and we are so small in number that we don't say what we think about people. <laughs> I was talking before the Association of Governing Boards of State Universities at Lansing not too long ago, and as I drove into the city of Lansing, I saw this billboard. It was really a map of the county in which Lansing is located with an arrow running down and said, you are here. So I said, now that gives me an idea of what is the difference between most people and inventors. Most people are interested in where they came from. The inventors are interested in where they're going. Now most people don't know where they're going. That's the reason why they're not interested in it. In this question of education, it's so easy to educate on where you came from. I think it was a Brookings Institution that made the study and said the more education you had, the less likely you was 
to be an inventor. And somebody said, that's a good reason for education. <laughs> but I think that we know the reason why that is, if it's so. There's two factors involved in that. From the time the kid starts the kindergarten up until he graduates from college, he's examined two or three or four times a year, and if he flunks from once, he's out. And that's, that's very bad. Now the inventor fails 999 times, and if he succeeds at once, he's in. <laughs> now the whole thing is illustrated by that is a point of view of failure. The inventor treats his failure simply as practice shots. And people want to be right, too right, in education. And because of the number they have to handle and so forth, they've set up these methods of looking at things. And so they get a, people afraid to fail. Now we think you have to learn how to fail intelligently. That is, when you fail, why did you fail? And what can you do to overcome it? Now there's another very distinct difference in this situation. And that is a point of view from which an inventor is working on a problem, a very definite problem. And therefore, he has to solve the kind of a problem it is. He wishes it wasn't that kind. We always could solve the problem in some other way. But that's the way it is. And so, so we say the problem has to be the boss. And that's hard for a lot of people to do, see? Say, well, if this problem was different, I could solve it. Say, well, you couldn't. It'd be just, that's just, that's just a subterfuge just to keep from having to walk up and face the one you got. <laughs> now, in education, there is two general kinds of education. That where you know a lot about one thing. That's a specialist. And the almost disappearing education are where you know something about a lot of things. An inventor has to have that kind of an education. That is, he can't be a physicist or a chemist or a biologist. He has to be whatever he has to be in order to solve the problem. Because these problems are not specialized. They're what they are. That's, that's been the trouble with this, why the grass is green. It didn't come out the way people wanted it to. Well, of course, the leaf didn't care how what people thought about it. It had been a leaf long before there was any people here. I was asked one time, what's the difference between a scientist and an inventor? I said, I thought the difference could be illustrated best by a loom where you weave cloth. The threads that run lengthwise the loom called the warp, that could represent your physics, your chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the threads that are put in by the shuttle will represent the work that the inventor does. Now the reason that scientists don't like inventors is because they're right angles to them. <laughs> they're neither fish nor fowl. They have to be a little bit of this, this, and this, and this, and this. And they at least ought to be on speaking terms with all of them. See? And they are important because I said, if you don't think that the shuttle or the wolf is an important thing, you try to sleep in a purely scientific hammock and see what happens to you. <laughs> I'm listening today, people are speaking about physicists and chemists and so forth. I thought that they were just parts of an education. I didn't know that they were the sum total of it. I thought if you're going to be an engineer or, or a scientist in general, you had to know a little something about all of those things. But apparently that isn't so. Apparently you just know one thing. And that is the thing that apparently is worrying our educators today. There was some gentlemen came over from England to see me, and they said that three years ago, the Board of Trade of England had commissioned them in, from Oxford to make a study of the technological situation in England and try to find out why they were losing their position technologically. Now, they made a study of about a year and a half, and they were amazed at what they found out. They came over here and coupled up with the University of Illinois, 
and they run some trial tests over here and find out that we were very much alike. They said, now, the reason we came to you is because we were told out at one of the universities that you had been talking about this thing for a long while, and we, we, we'd like to exchange opinions with you. Well, I said, I don't know what you found out, but I can tell you what you should have found out if you really made the right kind of a survey. I said, you found out just two things. First, that you were specializing. You were teaching too much about just one thing. And the fellow might be wonderful in that line, but he doesn't make a very good citizen because he can't see out of his ditch. He don't see what's going on in the country. He digs a ditch so deep he can't see out. See? And he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know why he's there. I said, oh, that's one of the things I think you should have found out. So I said, that's exactly what we found out. I said, the other thing you found out, that you were trying to substitute symbols for things. I said, symbols are all right if you know what the thing is. But to write the symbol when you don't know what the thing is, that don't get you very far. I said, that's an easy way to do if you can get away with it. Well, I said, we found that out too. But they said, that isn't what we want to talk to you about. So it's exactly what, what are we going to do about it? Oh, I said, that's a different problem. I said, now you have two ways that you can get some help. I said, the undertaker will remove some of the obstructions as time goes on. And I said, you have the cooperative system of where part of the kids can go to school part of the time and go out and work in industry part of the time. So you can mix these two things together. Just This is nothing but a cooperative uh, educational meeting we got here at the Edison Foundation. We're working back and forth. We're just the same in both sides. I think we're the same people. Some of you might have been in education last year and you're in industry now and vice versa. But it's the point of view from which we take these measures that is the important thing. Which brings me up to another thing that has worried me. And I'll tell you a little story. When Mr. Ford moved the Wright brothers' home and shops to Greenfield Village, Mr. Wright and Mr. Ford wanted me to be master ceremonies, and we had 30 minutes on the air. We had brought the flyers from all of this, the first flyers from all the important countries of the world. And I had had dinner with Mr. Ford the day before, and he said, now, Kent, what are you going to try to get across? Well, I said, I'd like to have 40 seconds of that 30 minutes to get across just one thing, that if Thomas A. Edison, the Wright brothers, and Henry Ford had taken IQ tests, they wouldn't have gotten in the bleachers. <laughs> <laughs> now, why? <laughs> Not because they were stupid. Because IQ tests have nothing to do with the fellow that's being tested. It has to do with what the fellow thinks he ought to be. It has nothing to do with the guy at all, see. He's what he is. He's what the Lord made him, see. And the fellow, fellow says, well, I think he ought to be like this. So he writes out these questions. Well, that has nothing to do with the fellow at all. So what you're doing... You're reflecting back what you wish he was. Well, he isn't that at all. He's what the Lord made him. And an educational system is supposed to take him and make the best out of him if they can, see? And it's amazing what some of those people that you'd throw out do. <laughs> There's a Dutchman by the name of Rudolf Hand, whose birthday was celebrated about four or five years ago, the 300th birthday. And Rudolf Hand was a very peculiar person. He couldn't read or write. He couldn't make change, or he couldn't tell what time it was. Now, why should you celebrate a 300th birthday of a fellow like that? Because he happened to be the greatest painter of birds and animals that has ever lived. Now, why would that fellow gotten off in an IQ test? It's amazing how people think that if you haven't gotten a degree in something, you can't possibly know anything about it. We had developed the things called Freon, which was a refrigerating gas. And uh, I was asked to present certificates to the boys who had worked on that. 
here in New York, and I'd had to go to, to another meeting, uh, another dinner, and I'd gotten to this one just when we were getting ice cream and coffee. And I sat down at a table, and I sensed right away that nobody knew where these freons came from. So when I came to present these uh, little certificates, I told a story of how we took the wallpaper off an old house dining room, and we papered it with white paper, and we drew the coordinates in there of the critical pressures and temperatures of all the known gases used in refrigerators. And right there where we'd like to have them, there was a big hole. So we said, how are we going to move them down? Well, we said, if we can just substitute some of the chlorine in some of those compounds with fluorine, we can move them down. Of course, everybody was horrified because they said you certainly wouldn't put fluorine in a refrigerating machine because it would eat it up. I said, I don't know. I think we ought to try it. And so we did, and it didn't. <laughs> in other words, it's one of the nicest, most accommodating gases in the world. I got back to the table. The fellow said, you had no right to make a talk like that. You're no chemist. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, you have no degree in chemistry. I said, where'd you get the freons from? He says, that has nothing to do with it. You have no right to talk on chemistry because you have no degree in chemistry. And so, since then, I've been very careful. <laughs> because I didn't know the degree had anything to do with it. Eh? And so the thing we need to recognize today, that what the fundamentals of education are, is to take the material that the Lord gave you and make the most out of it. See? If he's a left-handed guy, let him be a left-handed guy, but make him be the best left-handed guy that you ever saw. See? In other words, here's a kid writes left-handed. Well, the first thing you do is try to make him write right-handed. Well, I, I used to teach school, and one of the very peculiar things I had happen was this kid, very bright kid, came to school, and the only thing she could do was read upside down. She had to hold the book upside down. Well, it was quite simple. She had an infant grandmother, and the kid sat on a little stool in front of her grandmother, and her grandmother had the book right side up, and she'd learn to read over the top. <laughs> well... Of course, that was no good. You, 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 a kid couldn't go through life reading the newspapers. <laughs> so we got a little, we got a little music rack, and we turned it a couple of degrees every week. You see, and by the time it had to turn around. <laughs> now I know the problem of trying to take these specialized talents and develop them, but I think we need to recognize that something has to be done along that line to help them out. There's a lot of these fellows that can pass grades. 100% and so forth. They know how to use the handbook and do that very well. I call that stenographic engineering. But unless you have worked in these fields of where you try to do new things, you will not appreciate how terrifically difficult it is to do anything new. I don't care how simple it is. If you can read the marvelous experiences that Mr. Edison had, Anything that he did off of the beaten path was bad, see? Because you disturb people, and people don't want to be disturbed. I said, the reason for it, I think I know. I used to, it used to worry me a lot. Now, we can be a resident in space. You can live in Orange, you can live in New York, you can live in Milwaukee, Minneapolis, or any place you want to. And in that respect, you can be a resident in space. But you can only be a resident one 24 hours in November the 21st. Tomorrow's another day. Now, people would like to fix some of the things in time. That's why we talk about the good old days. That's why we study history so much. I've been trying to get just turn this thing around. How do you study the future? Because that's the important thing. And that's what you want to brighten up these kids for, see? Because they're going to spend all the rest of their lives in the future the same as you are. That's the reason why I'm so strongly interested in the future. I haven't got too much left, but I'm going to spend all the rest of my life in the future, see? Not in the past. So what you need to do is, how do you do that? 
Well, I've been trying to get a word that means exactly the opposite to history. And I haven't found anything. The nearest anybody suggests has been hysterics, which I don't think is any good. See? <laughs> but how do you study the future? How far in the future do you know? What are the things that control it? And so that is one of the things we need to do. You're educating people today for the next 15 or 20 years. Now, you at least ought to guess what it's going to be, because they'll forget what you taught them anyhow in 10 or 15 years, so they will hold up against you, see? But what are you going to do? You're never going to go back. I'd like to tell you just a little bit of what the hard-working sun does. It pumps the water to keep all the rivers running, which is no small job. And the way it evaporates water at normal temperatures is quite an important thing. It couldn't do it if the atmosphere wasn't heavier than water vapor. So all you got to do is brush it loose, and the heavy atmosphere pushes the water up, and then it has a convention up there and forms a droplet, and then it reverses the situation and falls back down. It grows all the vegetables. Now, in a year, it fixes about 100 billion tons of carbon. Takes it out of the atmosphere with the three one hundredths of one percent only of carbon dioxide in the air. And there's only forty percent of that carbon dioxide carbon. A hundred billion tons. We mine about six hundred million tons of coal. Then it furnishes the high tension electricity to knock out the public service once in a while, see, to make you appreciate how valuable it is when you get it back, see? So solar energy is quite an important thing. In a year on an Ohio farm, we can raise 100 bushels of corn. Now, an acre is 208 feet by 208 feet. It's not very big. And on that, you will get about two and a half, equivalent two and a half tons of carbon fixed. Now, you burn up about the weight of your automobile in gasoline per year. Consequently, if we knew how to convert it over into hydrocarbons instead of carbohydrates, we could run an automobile on what we raise on an acre of ground for a whole year and have some left over. So that we haven't gone very far in a lot of these things. And we're very likely, so to walk up and face some of these problems that we have to do, we're very likely to avoid them. Now, we think that our problem ultimately, in this why the grass is green thing, is going to come down to simply the relationship between a kilowatt hour of power and a pound of sugar. Nobody thinks in terms of that now. But I think any place you have power, you can have food without plants. Well, somebody could right away get excited. Well, what are the farmers going to do? Oh, well, they can get parity on that as well as they can. <laughs> now, we looked at birds until we learned how to fly, but we never put feathers on the airplanes. In fact, with all of the skill of all the aeronautical engineers in the world, we couldn't make a feather today. And all of our engineers and all our science can't make a leaf. But we can do the same thing that happens in the leaf. But it would look like a leaf. That's all I'm talking about. Somebody said, what do you think is going to happen to technology in the future? It's going to keep right on going. Because when you know so little about anything that's going on in the world, somebody's going to find out something tomorrow. And that's why I said, if I was writing a book today, I'd say the title would be, Yes, But Tomorrow Is Another Day. Most of the students who make up the college population have to work at least part-time in order to go to school. More would attend college if they had jobs that could pay their way. Cooperative education, the college program of working half-time and going to school half-time, is one of the important means both of providing motivation to study and financing higher education. The late Charles Franklin Kettering maintained a lifelong interest in education. He was one of the originators and a continuing supporter of the work-study of cooperative education college system. 
He was instrumental in organizing the General Motors Institute, which combines educational training and on-the-job experience. He helped organize the cooperative program at Antioch College and served as a trustee and active supporter of Antioch for 36 years. For Kettering, the mere possession of knowledge is not enough. It is the ability to use knowledge that matters. Kettering knew that people learn not only with their minds, but with their eyes and ears and hands. They learn not only from books, but from practical experience. He often described the difference between a traditional college education and cooperative education programs by comparing end-to-end -end welding and lap welding. The first just welds together, end-to-end, -end, two pieces of metal. But in lap welding, the two pieces are overlapped and then welded together. This makes much stronger joining. Education, Kettering said, consists of what you learn from books and what you learn from practical living. But usually the two learnings simply follow one after the other. In cooperative education, work-study education, the two overlap and both gain strength. Kettering had no patience with the notion of hanging on to a purely traditional form of programming in higher education. He said, I have no objection to the standardization of bolts and nuts and screws, but I do have a terrible obsession against the standardization of ideas. Now I turn to Mr. Kettering as he spoke to a large group of educators at a Thomas Alva Edison Foundation conference on cooperative education that was held in Dayton, Ohio in 1957. And so, on what was probably his favorite educational project, cooperative education, Mr. Kettering. The so-called co-op system had been developed at the University of Cincinnati under Dean Snyder 52 years ago, I think it was. And uh, we've seen it grow up around here. I've been definitely and directly associated with that work down there for a good many years. Then uh, that was purely from an engineering standpoint. Arthur Morgan undertook to revive Antioch on the basis of a co-educational co-op. In other words, you're going to use a liberal arts college as the basis upon which to put this. And the thing that he tied that to was he was going to train young men and young women for proprietorship. Now, that was a very clever way of saying that he was going to try to get a little action into the education. You know, I said the other day over at Columbus, that uh, I saw nothing very wrong with our educational system. The only thing is I'd like to change a few ratios a little bit. That uh, it was now about 90% procrastination and 10% action. But things have to change. I mean, we need to change, uh, we need to put some of our older educational ideas into the museums. And that's hard to do. But the demand and the rate in which things are moving is such that we need to take a look-see. I'm going back to the, the uh, idea of training young men and women for proprietorship was simply to try to get a purely theoretical setup which we had inherited from a long time back to this realistic type of education. Now, we were talking out here in the hall here a little while ago, and one of your speakers said that he was disturbed because his daughter's paper had been judged wrong because she didn't use the thing that the professor gave her in school. Well, I was a teacher in, a student teacher in physics at Ohio State University, and my entire section was flunked because we didn't use the equation that the uh, professor gave in the lecture, despite the fact that I got exactly the same answer. But he said, that isn't what counts. It's the way you do it. Eh? <laughs> and Dean Carson is here. He's dean of the School of Engineering at the Ohio State. And if you'll go back and look over some of the old records are there, we used to have to run a set of streetcar motors in, in, in the... Uh, electric lab, and uh, I did it with a team of three other fellas, and they got passed and I got flunked. And I did it over again, and I got flunked again. And I said, well, I had, they had the same figures that these other fellas had, see. Now, what was, the, what was the trick in that? 
Well, they plotted the curve the way he said it ought to be plotted in his lecture. And I plotted it according to the points. <laughs> And we, we went and got the, the past reports out of there, and from the time those motors were put in there, they had been plotted according to what the professor's lecture said, and these motors didn't even belong to that classification. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think it's good for you to get out and uh, see how industry is done. You know, I've said several times that I would give $10,000 to any department in any technical school to teach anything the way it was done. Well, now, there's two reasons for that. I'm going to be very liberal, is that they think that if they taught it the way it was done, that they would be lowering the academic standard of their institutions. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other would be maybe they didn't know, see? The thing I would like to do is to get everybody to understand that there's no difference in the problems that the educators have and that anybody else have. Along, and the, all the problems come from people. If you didn't have people, you wouldn't have these problems, but be awful lonesome. <laughs> so so we, we, we gotta take them. I was gonna tell you a little bit of a story because it happened right here in Dayton a number of years ago. When we first ran right at, square up against the fact that we had no way of painting automobiles. It took 34 days to paint a Cadillac car and 17 days to paint a Buick. And uh, if you were going to think of making a couple of thousand cars a day and you were going to hold them for at least 17 days, the sizes of which you had to build would have to build these paint plants would be terrific. See? But that was the only way. And every time you made any suggestion, whatever, the paint fellows could always say that they couldn't do that. And uh, so I had a, a paint conference. I had some actual painters, I had some manufacturers, and a whole bunch of them together. And I said, now what we want to do is to see if we can't reduce the time of painting. And they said, but you can't speed it up because it won't dry. It just won't dry. And I said, can't you do anything to speed up the drying? I said, no, you'll ruin the paint if you do. Finally, one fellow said to me, he says, how long do you think it ought to take to paint an automobile? Well, I said, to get the subject in front of the meeting, I'll say, I think an hour would be about right. <laughs> well, in a highly intellectual group like this, I wouldn't dare say what they t told me. <laughs> Then I said, but well, why couldn't you paint a car in an hour? And they said, you couldn't get it to dry. And as we were going out to lunch that day, one fellow said, I think we put that guy back in the corner where he's going to stay for a while. But I couldn't stay because I had to get the car <laughs> painted. Well, I was down in, uh, in New York and uh, was looking, shopping in the windows on Fifth Avenue. And in one of the jewelry stores there, I saw a little pin tray about that big round, made of wood. Had a beautiful lacquer on it. So I bought one of them. And I found out where it was made, and I went down to see the fellow who made it. And I asked him where he got the lacquer, and he said he got it over in Jersey. And I went over there, and I found the fellow was making it a little shed back in the back part of his yard. And I said I wanted to get a quart of it. And he said, my God, I never made a quart of that. <laughs> He said, he said, what do you want to do with it? Well, I said, I want to paint an automobile door. He said, you can't do it. He said, if you put that in a spray gun, it'll dry and blow away the dust. It'll never reach the door. <laughs> well, I said, can't you do something to slow it down? He said, not a thing in the world. So there I was, on one end, they couldn't, couldn't do a thing to speed it up, and the other end, they couldn't do a thing to slow it down. <laughs> and out of that, modulating those two things, we got this, uh, this uh, new type of paint, <laughs> and it, it, uh, it did pretty good. But we had, after we had this meeting, a friend of mine who was in the paint business came around to see me one day, and 
I happen to have one of these uh, color cards, you know, that you get different kind of colors laying on my desk. And I said, Joe, if you was going to have your car finished, oh, well, what, what color would you have? And he picked that out. And then we went to lunch. And when he came back, he said, well, I've got to be going. He said, somebody took my car. I said, no, nobody took your car. You said that was the color you wanted to paint it. <laughs> that you made that transition. Of course, now we, we finish them, we paint them all right in line. And uh, don't, don't, don't think that you did that without a lot of changes. After we developed that paint, we couldn't get a single division in General Motors to try it out. <laughs> Not a one. And in order to get uh, some cars to finish, they had thrown about 200 old bodies in a stone quarry up at Pontiac. And I took a little wrecking car out there and I hooked some off of the top. I got about a half a dozen of the bodies off of the top. And I dinged them out and sandblasted them and painted them. Now that model had been out of production for quite a while, but these looked so good. They put them on cars and sold them and that's where they made the mistake. <laughs> After they had him out there a while, they said, why can't we get this on all the cars? And what do you suppose the answer was? We can't put it on the cars because the priming coat isn't right for it. Well, we can't put another priming coat? No, this, we, this is our standard priming coat. <laughs> so one of our divisions said they'd try it, and they finished them with these new paints, and when they'd drive them down over a, a curb, whole pieces of paint would fall off. And they said, don't you see? You can't put that stuff on there. Well, I said, can't you put another priming coat on? No, she said, we've adopted that, and that's our standard. <laughs> so finally, we did a very interesting thing. I went to the, the general manager of that division, and I said, don't you think it might be possible to give that fella a month or six weeks vacation? <laughs> And there's a fellow who liked to fish and it was just about the right time to fish, so we got him to go away for six weeks. I think he's still fishing now. <laughs> but we put on a Duco priming coat and we had no trouble. And almost instantaneously, when they found it wouldn't fall out, everybody began to do this. But we still, we still haven't got a perfect paint. We're gaining on it all the time. But to change from 17 days to one hour was quite a step. Now, I don't think that we're talking about any radical change like that in education at all. But if we can simply blend the world in which the boy is going to live, blend that with his academic thing, we know that it results in a very satisfactory thing. I have made this statement many times, and maybe a lot of you will want to counteract it. It's all right if you do, that the consensus of studied opinion is always wrong. <laughs> Especially if it has to do with a new project. Now that is quite simple. Because that consensus of studied opinion, without taking a new thing into consideration, will always be handicapped on two counts. First, that the consensus of the opinion of the people will be first a very amateurish opinion if it's a new thing and the next thing is most of those committee people have their own faces to save i've been working on a problem for a great many years 35 or more on the simple thing is why is the leaf of a plant green because we say why is the grass green well a good friend of mine happened to be over in england a couple of years ago and a little book, fresh off the press, attracted his attention. And he was so excited about it, he called me up over the overseas telephone and says, Cat, these boys have got this over here. One of my men are coming back, and I'm going to give him a couple of these books, and he'll mail them to you when he gets to New York. So in about four or five days, I got this thing, and I was very excited about the thing, so I opened it up. First chapter. The active principle in blue-green algae is phycocyanin. 
Well, of course, I didn't know exactly what that meant. But I took down the telephone and called one of my boys. And I said, what is the structural formula of phycocyanin? And he didn't know. And I called Brentano's here in New York to see whether they had any other books on it. They didn't have them. Finally, I got back to Dayton, which is my home. And I have one of these big Oxford and Bridge dictionaries, which is not a, a, a technical dictionary. But I thought I'd look in there and see if it had it. And sure enough, there it was. Phyco is the Greek word for algae, and Simon is the Greek word for blue. <laughs> so you went out the front door and walked around the house and came back in again. <laughs> we say we're working on why the grass is green. People say, oh, you're working on chlorophyll. I said, no, we're working on why the grass is green. All you said, the word chlorophyll is just a Greek for green leaf. And we don't know any more about it in Greek than we do it in English. One of the very interesting little stories about a slide rule happened up at McGill University a great many years ago. And this was always given to the freshman class. And where the professors said, now you young men are going to be engineers. And one of the great tools of engineering is the slide rule. And let me explain it to you. So he tells about the four scales on the slide rule and so forth. It was developed by Lieutenant Marnheim of the French uh, artillery and so forth. Now, he said, let's take a very simple problem. Let's multiply two by two. He said, we pick out two on the lower scale. We move the slide till the end comes directly over it. Then we take the index and move it till it's over the other two. And then we read the answer. 3.98, practically four, gentlemen, practically four. <laughs> I told that story at a big engineering meeting in Chicago one time, and a fellow came around to me and he said, I couldn't see anything funny about that. I said, he said, that's about as close as you can read a slide. <laughs> well, I used to have my engineering to gang together. I said, now, take your slide rules out of your pocket and lay them on the table. Because the only thing I've ever gotten out of a slide rule is when I propose a new problem some fellow will pull, sneak one of these little 10 inch slide rules out of his vest pocket and slip it. He said, but boss, you can't do that. You went out and made a Gallup survey today of what people think of uh, diesel engines that all say they're big, heavy, slow speed, see? Not a thing of it is so. The kind that were built were like that, but it had nothing to do with it. Because a diesel engine could be built just as light as any other kind of engine in the world. After the war was over, some of our friends from Switzerland came over to see us. And uh, they were amazed at this terrific development uh, that we had made over here in the way of locomotives and various other things. And finally, they came over to see me. I knew these fellows very well. And they said, Kent, will you uh, uh, get sore if we ask you an impertinent question? I said, no, I never get sore about anything. I said, what's the question? I said, how did you get yourself into the state of mind that you could design such a cockeyed engine today? <laughs> Well, I said, it's only cockeyed because it's in convention. At least I said that's right. But I said, we didn't design it. I said, all we did was run errands for it. We built a single cylinder engine, and we said to the engine, now, here's a half a dozen pistons. You try them out and tell us which one you like the best, eh? <laughs> here's a half a dozen valves. Try them out. And well, now, that, that stands in the intellectual uh, world as a very low-grade way of doing things. It's called... <laughs> And the educator wants to call it cut and try. We, we don't call it. We're not that dumb, see. Uh, we call it experimental evaluation. See, that gives us a much higher standing in the, in, the, in the educational world. We said, we let the engine evaluate this thing. And we ran errands for this engine for four or five years. And finally, we put it together. We made it into a 16 or 12 or 16 cylinder engine, put it on a locomotive, and it went out and did pretty well. Now, uh, I said, if that engine doesn't work, it's not our fault. Because that's the way it wanted to be. And all we did was, was, was try to help it along. Now, I said, I want to show you how much smarter the engine is than the engineer. Because that's important. Because we think we've got a slide rule, you know. Why, that's all right. I said, the best that any engineer would guarantee the pistons and rings for a locomotive engine was 50,000 miles. But I said, the engine picked out a piston that'll run a million and a half miles. That's 30 times as long, see? And the rings run 10 times as long in these engines as any engineer would venture, see? Well, now, why? Simply because we let the engine decide, see? 
We're not so smart, you know. Especially if we get a formula, that's when we get dangerous, when we get a formula written down. Yeah? <laughs> because a formula is a very narrow road. I have this old story that I, I have told a great many times, and it's only good because it's true, see, which most stories oh, usually are. But I live in Dayton. That's where my home is. I can't get a job there, so I have to work in Detroit. <laughs> and naturally, I drive back and forth an awful lot between Dayton and Detroit uh, and fly a lot. And this friend of mine, who also lives in Detroit, said to me one day, he said, I understand you drive from Dayton to Detroit in four hours and a half. I said, yes, I do. He said, I don't believe it. I said, why? Well, he said, I'm a much better driver than you are, and I can't do it in four hours and a half. Well, I said, I'm going down on Friday afternoon, but don't you ride along down? And so we drove down, and we got into Dayton in four hours and a half. He said, well, my God, no wonder you can do it in four hours and a half. You don't stay on Route 25. <laughs> We like to take people who are not educated in a line and put it on a research, because then they don't know what can't be done, and they'll try. Uh, Thomas Midgley came to me as a mechanical engineer, and I put him on hydrometers, because I wanted to try out a number of different kinds of hydrometers. He had been making hydrometers for the determination of the temperature to which the antifreeze would go. You take a sample of it out, and then that would tell you how cold you could go without freezing. Well, that business hadn't gone very well, so he came on and got a job with me. Because I had a hydrometer job. So after I got that job done, he said, Boss, what do you want me to do next? And I said, I want, I want you to go over in my office in the old Delco plant and get a box. And I want you to open that box up. You'll find some instruments in there, some old greasy papers and so forth, where I was doing some work on engines because I wanted to find out why engines knock. And I took a whole Saturday afternoon to sell him the idea that this was quite an important project. And I said, everything that's in the books and everything that everybody thinks about this thing is wrong. So you've got a perfectly clear slate to start with, so don't read any of the books, because you're going to get into trouble as sure as you do. Well, I meant you never had any chemistry at all. And he went along a little while, and finally he said, don't you think we want a chemist? And I said, no, what do you want a chemist? I said, he doesn't know any more about that than we do. And I said, he's going to come in with a pack on his back. And I said, we're going to make a very steep climb here, and it may be that that, uh, that, uh, that very pack is going to keep us from getting up. Let you and I go up and survey the road without any packs on our backs, and then we'll get some chemists. Well, Midge died as president of the American Chemical Society. <laughs> with all the medals, with all the medals that Europe and America can hang on one guy, see? 